All right, so getting started here. Um, so welcome to Criminal Minds, World's Most Wanted Cyber Criminals Interview Insights. My name is Samantha Vandeven, and I work in Threat Intel, and this, representation, this <laughs> presentation represents thoughts of myself only, and not those of any organization I work with. So in the last decade, cyber criminals have been observed engaging in public-facing media interviews more than 20 times after a widely publicized media attention-grabbing breach. Rather than hide in the shadows, they chose to move toward the limelight to say something about it. For cyber criminals who are traditionally expected to operate in the shadows, in dark corners of the market, in dark corners of the dark web, dark markets, the cyber underground, we would expect them to continue engaging in activities to further lay low and further keep themselves anonymized, such as engaging in best operational security practices, using tools and careful measures to operate as they wish without getting caught. However, a phenomenon has been observed over the last decade in which cyber criminals have increasingly opted to knowingly intentionally engage in interviews with the public facing media. They're revealing details about themselves, their lives, their motivations, and their operations. So many times, articles are posted about them and analyzed very single-handedly, and some analysis is conducted on them. Maybe some of these details are incorporated into a threat actor profile. But presently, no re public research exists analyzing all of these interviews over time, putting them into context and understanding what we can learn from them. And by contextually and chronologically analyzing these public-facing engagements, we can dive deeper into some of these questions we may have, such as how and why does someone begin to engage in cybercrime? Why would they choose to do an interview? So everything that we look at here today can be looked at through the lens of this criminological framework, the square of crime. And this idea is really that the nature and the prevalence of any crime conducted in a society at any point in time is understood only as the crime is analyzed in the context of the attack and in its interaction with these four outlined elements. So we see law enforcement, its agencies, the adversary, the targets and victims, and the public and the media. Since crime is a product of these formal and informal interactions between each of the components of this framework, it's really important to understand why actors would be engaging in certain actions, what makes victims vulnerable, and the factors that make certain targets attractive. Um, these factors that are in public attitudes and responses to cybercrime are also a part of the so social forces at play here. And across this square, we see cooperation, arrests, and pushback, and those interactions that are happening with all these pieces are really what's key. Here we can really see threat actors deliberately and effectively leveraging the media and see how a cyber criminal may speak differently with the public after maybe reading something about themselves or headlines about one of their own attacks or how an individual may engage in illicit activity after seeing how much money there is to be made in ransomware. So moving forward into the research, um, what do we do with all these interviews? What can we make sense of them? Um, so really want to highlight here that there were 57 total interviews, and they're from 41 different unique actors from 29 media organizations. And this is really interesting because the ways that questions are maybe asked to an actor or maybe responded to are going to be different based on the persons asking the questions, and the questions are going to be different but here we can see what the actors choose to speak about because it's not necessarily the same person asking the same questions every time and sometimes they'll stop this conversation and decide to talk about the thing that they want to talk about. We also have an interesting area in which there were nine repeat actors, so they actually saw that the risk of coming forward and talking about their activities was worth talking about multiple times even though it was a risk to them. Additionally, other important criteria for the interviews that were used in this session for this research were that they were all public-facing written media articles. And this is really interesting to us because it's not something like the Conti leaks where we were seeing actor communications and documents that weren't meant to be seen by the public. This is all based upon what actors wanted to see in the public. 
We also have that each of these were, yeah, the actor knowingly participated. They wanted to do this engagement and that their legitimacy was substantiated. And what this really just means is that the interviewer at some point did some research or tried to make sure that the person that they thought they were talking to was actually the person um, behind the screen. And the interviewees included malware and exploit developers, initial access brokers, ransomware affiliates, operators, and admins. Additionally, all of the interviewees um, identified as male that we know of. And um, yeah, what's really important here is that it's a sample of individuals who willingly took the risk to discuss more information about themselves and saw some benefit of speaking to the press or security reachers outweighing not doing it. So for self-identifying geographical distribution, this is a representation of the places that the actors said that they were from. It could be that there are a lot more countries that could have been identified on this list, but they were not stated by the actors that that's where they were from. Um, and other demographic factors were that they were across various ages and teens, 20s, 30s, um, often quite young, and that um, these are individuals that appear to be leading seemingly normal lives that are filled with family demands, work deadlines, leisure activities, and that they had various hobbies, they went to top colleges, they might be working in legitimate IT jobs, and um, yeah, so they're, they're kind of from everywhere. Um, so diving into the interviews conducted over the last decade, and it was cho chosen to focus on the last decade because this is when the frequency of the amount of interviews really started to pick up. So we can see that there were, the four main categories were broken down into post-arrest. This was an interview that was conducted right after an apprehension, and there was some discussion based on maybe why they were arrested, what their thoughts are on their activities now, some morality, some sentiment analysis can be um, conducted there. Post-retirement, this is when an individual is saying that they, they didn't get in trouble, there was no real consequence or reason for them stepping away, but they wanted to indicate that they wanted to stop conducting this activity. Post-breach, this in the last, these last two categories are the most important that we really wanna focus on here. Post-breach really is where an individual is speaking specifically about an, one intrusion, one event, one thing that's splashing the headlines that they want to address versus brand building. It might be an interview conducted based on different brands, um, the discussion of their name, uh, what their oppor opportunities are, what their operations are like, and d digging into the differences between those. The brand building might reference some very highly public intrusions or things that have happened recently, but they're not just referencing one event or trying to respond to that one event. And we can see over time that there's been consistent and increasing brand building activity and also post-breach. So actually coding the interview data, making the most the sense of all these different interviews. So first collected all the different interviews that were out there that fit that criteria that we discussed previously, put them in chronological order, and then systematically categorized experts from the qualitative data to identify themes and patterns. So there are 12 different themes here. I know the, the text is a little small, but I'll, I'll walk through them with you. Um, and this was all done to increase the validity of the data and the findings and really detach from any preconceived notions about the actors and decrease bias and really enable transparency. Um, so that first category is demography. So those, those characteristics we discussed previously, which of these interviews is discussing um, how old they might be, what country they're living in, what they're working in. Initiation is any of these discussions where they are discussing why they got involved in cybercrime, what made them first go on the cyber underground, what got them into these forums and conducting these activities. And then persistence, not why did they first ever do it, but why did they keep doing it? What made them do it the second time? What made them do it the third, fourth time? Why have they been at it for years? Despite the risk or the consequences or potential consequences, why are they still opting to engage in these activities? Then we have exiting, um, and this is really speaking to why someone's leaving the underground or discussing maybe wanting to leave, um, seeing that things are, maybe their mental health is deteriorating, maybe something scary happened recently. Um, and so there's some discussion there. 
Recruitment, this is when there were direct statements made about recruitment. Maybe there are other things that were discussed that could be interpreted as a means to recruit, but these were discussions based on wanting to recruit individuals and looking to have others join their operations. Professionalization, this is that idea that some of the cyber underground economy and some of the activities there are mimicking the traditional economy and we're seeing different division of labor and specialization and all of these things come together to make more and more professional levels of activity uh, in, at scale in, in these operations. Setting the record straight is a very, very interesting category that came up also time and time again in these interviews in which an actor was discussing something or, or the interviewer at was asking about something and the, the actor specifically said, oh, that's not the story, this is actually the story and really wanting to that, set that record straight and say what their narrative was or sh further shape the narrative that they were seeking to achieve. The square of crime, it's referencing what we spoke about recently and they're not discussing the square of crime but they might discuss a reason why they engaged in a certain activity or why they chose not to do something based on when they saw it in the press or a victim saw a certain thing. So that's that category. And then um, morality and sentiment. This is uh, where actors were discussing maybe what's good, what's bad, any of those really emotionally charged words, the feelings uh, that were here. And the beauty of this research is that when you're putting all these things into these expert excerpts and categorizing them, you can see the certain words come up over again. Um, so things like fear and confidence and excitement and those sorts of things. And tactics, techniques, and procedures. Um, here, this, these were mapped to the MITRE ATT&CK framework, te tactics, techniques, and procedures, and just any, anything revealed about the operations that the actor was willing to share. And lastly, um, security recommendations. So sometimes actors themselves would have a security recommendation that they wanted to um, bring up or recommend that some do in order to actually uh, make sure that these don't happen in the future. So um, we know these topics are starting to splash more in the headlines and more of a spotlight is being put on them. And not only do many you know, stats and data point to this, but we can see that more and more of the details on this and of these attacks with these individuals um, are becoming more and more a part of our society and the discussions we have about them. You know, the cybercrime is making the headlines like never before. I'm sure you're seeing that in a lot of other talks, so I won't bore you with that. Um, but, you know, it's kind of a big deal as well when your friends, your family are asking like, hey, you work in cybersecurity, right? I, th I saw that thing in the news. Um, you know, what should I be doing? Or what are these guys doing? They're asking more details. It's becoming more of a common part of our vocabulary. And, you know, they'll chat with you about cybersecurity recommendations and shake their head. Um, but yeah, these, these ideas, these things, they have ripple effects on the ways that someone might adopt a good cybersecurity practice or decide to engage in cyber underground communications themselves or operations themselves. So just gaining a solid understanding of how the narrative is shaping and seeing how this is being pushed through society can give us a better understanding of where we may be headed in the future and how to adapt to these shifts in our policies and mitigation measures. So insights, what can we get out of all of this stuff? So 22% of all of the interviews analyzed actually discussed being self-taught and um, most often referenced video tutorials, training guides on both the surface web and the dark web. And they might have had education backgrounds in these disciplines or they may have been transitioning from legitimate IT work where they may have gained some of these transferable skills. But this is where they referenced really gaining their knowledge to engage in some of this illicit cyber activity. Time and time again, these online step-by-step -step tutorials, blogs, and online videos really kept them learning, and they noted that they learned by doing a lot of them, and spent a lot of dedication and time learning specific things, and similar to the traditional economy, pivoting to what's most lucrative once they kind of got a feeling of what was most wanted in the underground, where the most opportunities were, or once they were up to a certain level of skill that they could continue to skill up and learn something that was more lucrative. And topics included 
pen testing, programming in various languages, cryptology, SQL and XSS injections, remote and local file inclusion attacks, open source intelligence, and underground intel connection. And they referenced also reasons for getting involved in these things. You know, what made them kind of take the plunge of starting to look at these videos or these forums or these blogs? Like, why did they even take the first plunge? And many times they were related to layoffs, that they were in a hard spot with a lot of skills and no job to really turn to, or they felt that they had skills that could be better utilized in the cyber underground based on something they'd read, or they came across something like a medical debt that they couldn't overcome and pay themselves and felt kind of stuck in this offer a way out and a way of opportunity. Um, others also just included curiosity and a willingness to learn and realizing that it could be lucrative off of that. So for recruitment, we saw a very, very common theme of these interviews, and that's the promotion of the idea that anyone with curiosity and determination can do it. So commonly discussed was an encouragement to take pride and curiosity in accumulated knowledge, and that many were seeking new and younger affiliates so that they could kind of mold them. Um, they're seeking individuals who were looking for a challenge and that they could be mentoring. Um, they discussed wanting individuals with technical savviness and bright minds and maybe seeing something in them that the traditional economy may not and kind of sometimes bashed the traditional nine to five model not and that promoting the idea that there weren't maybe rules there that the traditional nine to five jobs may have for people who work on salaries um, avoiding the bureaucracy and the lack of flexibility and not earning the money they felt they deserve. So these topics were time and time again discussed and kind of influencing reasons for maybe re individuals would want to engage in cybercrime. There was also a lot of discussion on the amount of money one could make and that their group was maybe the best group that anyone could work with. And reasons for that included that decisions were made collectively, that trust was endowed in associates to negotiate by themselves, that they maybe had great profit sharing ratios, and that they would pay directly to wallets um, so that they could have the money that they wanted right in their wallets and at, of their choice of cryptocurrency. Um, they often touted as well like high retention rates and just a lot of this encouragement to take pride and curiosity and join them. So, we can see that these are being discussed and shaped and, and not really um, fed, but just being discussed. And seeing also that there was a discussion on the golden number of affiliates. So they would have ransomware programs and they would be inviting people in or wanting to have interviews to take more people in, but they would close when the quality or quantity was reached that they wanted. And they tried to keep their group really small so that they could be careful of who would join. Um, and mem often referenced that member management was very, very difficult and that they had to fire many people over the years due to uh, untrustworthy actions and um, that it was, it was very difficult there. So moving into the different MITRE ATT&CK TTPs, we can see that a lot of the different a lot of actors act in very different ways, have different ways of accomplishing things, and not every actor in these 57 interviews was a ransomware operator or admin. Some were malware developers or initial access brokers, so there were a lot of different things there. But we did see a lot of patterns over targeting and initial access and um, the impact that they had on different organizations. So when it came to targeting, often revenue, in location were the most important factors for targeting. Not so much industry, uh, it was mostly focused on seeking large organizations with bigger revenues, and this was due to it being easier to obtain ransom payments and navigating networks, a lot easier than small organizations which may have things organized in different ways. And we also saw that ransomware operators were assessing targets worth 
either by finding stolen information on these companies on the dark web from uh, different ways of seeing how they were posted about in previous breaches or leaked data, or that they saw information from insiders at the target organizations who sell this information directly on these underground forums. And from following the habits of individuals, uh, they also would gain information to mimic them, um, such as their spending habits and, and various things in order to um, keep these up. Uh, with op also with open source intelligence, we saw that actors really tried to keep up to date with the latest cybersecurity developments to weaponize research in their attacks. And also uh, with initial access of leveraging zero day vulnerabilities and human nature with social engineering attacks. Also for scanners that they often used included MassScan, NMAP, and RustScan uh, for port and ne network exploration. And for resource development, this is where we really saw them collaborating with other groups, operating telegram channels, um, having as many trustworthy contacts as possible so that they could text them when they needed a favor or needed help or anything like this. We also see that they used a lot of tools as red teamers but usually developed additions on top of these to on things that they felt may be missing or something that they could craft to make a little bit better. So we see them using bits and pieces of everyone's things to kind of create the best things that they want. So professionalization. Um, here we can see some of these categories that were discussed previously with the 12 uh, different categories that the interviews were sorted into. And we see that they really specialized and divided up their labor in order to actually put these operations to scale. And these were their branches for extortion, um, divvying operations up by skill with the most technically skilled hackers getting into databases and less skilled individuals maybe sweeping up whatever's valuable out of compromised accounts and then individuals with the least level of experience or technical capabilities, putting them in charge of what, whatever they can kind of tr turn a profit from. We also see that there's a lot in uh, of governance associated with these groups and that they might have a voting system on who to target next. And um, that again, that with the collaboration and networking that they may keep in touch with as many people as possible, um, having a person for everything they could need, and, and try and get favors from various individuals. We see that they're very profit-driven, having very rapid communication and uh, dedication to the bottom line, um, trying to kind of exchange information on tactics and techniques to really understand how to make kind of the most money po possible. Um, for repeat interviewers, uh, we saw this individual who interviewed or who engaged in a public facing interview six different times over the last few years. And at first, maybe they kind of set up what they were doing, what they were up to, uh, who they were. And this, you can see that they slowly started to talk more and more about recruitment in every single interview that they did. And setting the record straight and sentiment, you know, kept kind of stable. But when there was a certain event that they wanted to address and saw that there was, they saw that there was a sentiment um, analysis and setting the record straight analysis very, very capable. Um, so you can see that a lot of these words were, were here in this frequency analysis where we could see different emotionally charged words being used and a really a call to the story that they were seeking to tell. Um, rather than discuss recruitment, they wanted to focus on the story that they wanted to tell by engaging in this interview. And so for continuation of illicit activity, um, we can see that variable rewards, um, things that are associated with, you, you might engage in something and not exactly know if it's going to be successful or if it's not going to be successful, we can see that these things are very, very powerful and they might drive someone to continue to do these things again and again. So similar to principles of gaming or gambling or social media use, uh, variable rewards are a really powerful tool for increasing the motive of someone starting or continuing to engage in something. 
So we can see that those thrill of those desire of achieving those desired outcomes is, is very powerful. One might try to gain access to something and realize that the access they gained is far greater than they expected to once they're actually in the environment. Or we may see that they try to then to get the access and they don't. And then when they finally do, it's like a rush. It, it finally happened. So early drivers uh, really in included this curiosity, um, opportunity that could happen in various socioeconomic factors such as um, being in a position where they wanted to make more money or they felt that there were more opportunities elsewhere and then subsequent factors for maybe why they wanted to continue doing this uh, time and time again after included uh, power and a sense of influence because you know, the actors we're talking about here are the ones that are commonly splashing the headlines and are really being published about often and they can see a direct correlation with what they're doing the effort that they're putting in to learn something using those skills and then actually get, seeing these results happen where they're able to make a fine turn a financial profit or actually uh, see the, see the uh, tech techniques um, on big screens. And we also see that they get this freedom from the traditional job market. There's also this idea that there's um, some amusement sometimes involved. This is not you know, for everyone as well, but these were just themes pulled from the various uh, categories. But you know, some enjoyed this act of impersonation or becoming someone else. Kind of like Halloween, we like to dress up and be someone else for a day. There's a there's, uh, part of it where someone might feel a bit amused. Um, so we also saw choice as a very, very powerful part of this all, similar to anything that we do often and we say, okay, okay, we'll put the phone down or we'll, we'll step away from this. They see that they can always pull out of the scene and leave all together, that it's kind of easy to get out of, um, that there might be little to no consequences um, and not all the time, but that th they could essentially, if they wanted to, step away. And just situating these individuals in the broader context, um, these people are living normal lives with families, sometimes bosses not giving them credit, and various factors are overlapping to cause them to engage in cybercrime um, or even do these interviews. So um, when it comes to tangible social mo mobility, this is a really, really powerful part of this as well. Uh, actors discussed from not eating for days or wearing multiple coats to keep warm to becoming a millionaire. And they were able to see, have this kind of self-actualization and self-realization and put their tactics to the test and, and see that they were capable of creating a really powerful program and that they were capable of something. They see that they went from maybe not having so much hope for the future to actually having this very tangible thing that they could work on and see their efforts um, profit from. And this freedom from the traditional job market as well. We see that there's more seniority. They can spend the time that they want on it when they want to. Um, they can work from home or remotely. And that this idea is sometimes promoted that they can earn as much as they want and retire on their own terms. So this slide, um, actor supplied security reports. So these were referenced very, very often. And um, this is in relation to when ransomware actors sometimes provide a detailed security report to a ransomware victim in an effort to say, okay, this is how we got into your environment and this is what you should do to make sure that it doesn't happen again. So there's this idea that the promotion of the subversion of systems can be actually beneficial rather than harmful, um, that's put forward many, many times. Um, the, and then they, by tying in these mitigation recommendations or saying this is how it won't happen again, they can kind of avoid that blame or put the blame elsewhere. Um, there can be this idea that they're actually teaching companies how to properly secure their data and that if they pay money or ransom, it's almost like paying a fine and that it won't happen again. Uh, just really important to identify that these narratives are being said time and time again and to, to recognize uh, how these things are happening. 
There was also, it was also discussed that when they were asked sometimes what do they think the hardest part of cybersecurity is, is that there's no methodology for testing every individual staff and what they would do in a certain situation until it came up. And um, so for morality and sentiment, those very emotionally charged words that were being used in these different interviews, what were people speaking about, there were many actors who were divided between continuing their activities and operating everything they're doing on a much larger scale or implementing new techniques and putting a stop to it all, uh, erasing all traces from the public scene and really like leaving all together. They, there's that idea again that they always have a choice um, with maybe limited consequences, but targeting hospitals and other healthcare institutions were absolutely one of the most div divisive topics Affiliates usually stated they're prohibited from targeting two specific entities, usually medical hospitals and government entities. And they expressed um, often feeling alone or finding some things tricky to navigate by themselves, that they have this kind of secret life, that maybe they're scared of consequences. I mean, it really ranges. Everyone feels very different things. But commonly, there was some fear uh, involved in some things at various points. And some of these interviews, instead of mi uh, kind of minimizing that crime, they're kind of maximizing how it's difficult to um, have a secret life. And there's also this idea of reducing the bear of burden that if they don't do this, that someone else will. And when it came to an anonymity, that the, the, this depersonalization and also the anonymity, um, it can lead to kind of a lack of maybe remorse for actions and saying like, we're behind a screen and um, we're able to better uh, keep continuing this activity. So exiting the underground, um, apprehension, what, what happens when actors actually, they've gotten involved, they want to continue doing this, but now they want to stop, they want to leave, and um, they're leaving the cyber underground. So some pursued white hat activity after feeling that they maybe didn't have anything else to prove or they didn't want to try and make that money on that scale or deal with those sort, certain level of risks. Um, others were very loud about leaving and this could be to obfuscate um, maybe activities to rebrand on the underground. Others uh, left for deteriorating mental health reasons um, or stress. And we saw others who disbanded sometimes due to team structure being too complicated or having weakened trust or different operations and seeing that wasn't really worth it anymore. So moving into takeaways. So some of the key findings from this presentation um, include interactions and information flow between offenders and victims, the public, media, and the law enforcement that will impact individuals' decisions to persist or disengage from cyber criminal activities. And relative deprivation and lack of opportunities to really achieve social status and economic expectations and nationwide corruption um, can pertain to individuals uh, de deciding to engage in cybercrime or not. We also see that there's a lot of money to be made out there, but time and time again, trustworthiness is the most powerful currency in the cyber underground. In interviews, cyber criminals aspire to demonstrate their trustworthiness as well as organizations that they may attack in the future and demand ma ransom from the future. Um, this way, you know, if they do an interview or something, they're searchable, they have an online presence, they have that brand, and they may be more likely to obtain a ransom payment in the future. And this trust, this collaboration, and deal-making often hinge on these relationships, which is really established on these mutual interests and common goals. And so these actors were really observed engaging in these interviews for three primary reasons. To shape the narrative regarding a highly public cyber event, to promote a new malware service product release, or to garner recognition to gain legitimacy to increase the likelihood of a ransom payment or boost their reputation to recruit more affiliates. So 
Across time, um, criminals have engaged with the media and come out of the shadows to share information with the broader audience. And now after putting this information into context, uh, we're not always seeing a single interview or a single report uh, in isolation, but we can see these acts as part of a larger movement. We can see developments in brand awareness from these individuals, and we can see that building a reputation is actually a rational investment for engaging in a public-facing media interview. So through the views of sociology and criminology and taking into account the findings that we have from social and qualitative research, uh, we can achieve more holistic views that can contribute to new solutions and ideas. Moving past these us versus them ideologies and kind of moving in a way also from anything that's overly simplistic of why someone might be getting involved in these things, we can acknowledge that there are a lot of factors at play and that might be influencing someone to engage in these criminal activities. And instances in everyday life can really be a breeding ground that would make someone want to engage in these forums or engage in these things on the cyber underground. There's various demographic factors, characteristics, traits, vocational backgrounds, and different stressors and pressures, a lot of conflicts and problems that could lead to someone wanting something more. It can be something like a, a very difficult medical debt or someone or having a layoff and not being able to continue their job and needing a different way to make money. So where are we headed? Um, there's been a lot of different headlines. These are all from this 2024 and end of 2023, uh, recently about increasing layoffs, increasing inequality, and these things are really important to recognize that individuals may turn to lower barrier to entry dark web offerings. Um, there are a lot of different illicit activity opportunities. There are many offerings for insiders to engage in these things, and we've seen it before, and now we can know and look for patterns to better prepare for the future. Sometimes these highly skilled individuals may really want to have more work in an area that they might feel more rewarded from and uh, use these highly transferable skills to, and feel more acknowledged. You can see that these really, really powerful feelings of disillusionment or disenfranchisement, disgruntlement, all the disses, <laughs> um, may contribute to these feelings of someone wanting to turn to these activities. Um, and meanwhile, many advertisements are being posted to cyber underground forums uh, seeking to hire insiders or offering opportunities for requests for quick cash. We see this mostly a lot with, right now, code developers and AI experts. They're highly sought after. And these can be quick extra cash opportunities. And this really signifies how we want to be like treating our workforce well and really rewarding talent, supporting them, acknowledging employees, and attracting and retaining this talent. So moving into specific next steps and, and things that we can be doing based on these interviews that are coming out and in the narratives over time, um, with scanning and with seeing what's out there, conducting digital footprint assessments, um, getting yourself in the same headspace as intruders in your environments and look at how they learned what they're doing in order to actually protect yourself. Um, scan your own environments the way that hack they're doing it um, get your hands on the training materials that they're using and keep up with how TTPs are developing and how this is being integrated into different environments. And keeping up to date on threat intel. Um, you know, cyber criminals are avid consumers of security news and remain up to date on the latest research and vulnerabilities and often weaponize that information to use in future attacks. They are often self-taught and hungry for continual knowledge and that organizations should really be always encouraging their security teams to continue their own lear learning, not just by obtaining industry uh, respected certificates, but also keeping up to date with all that latest open source information that's coming out, conducting their own research, and closely following trends in the threat landscape. And for security awareness training, uh, the power of the narrative. Taking advantage of the language of cybercrime and events that are becoming more commonplace in our vocabularies. 
they're in our day to day, um, using real examples from everything, using these stories that you're seeing in the headlines or different things happening to organizations that you're hearing in your ISACs, telling these stories to your employees, to your friends, to your family, explaining in really simple terms what they need to do and ensuring that they feel that they're part of the solution. Sometimes pointing to these actual stories or these examples in your security awareness training practices, so, uh, you can actually have people uptake practices that they might feel were too difficult or weren't worth their time or aren't going to really affect them. But things like having password managers, having their 2FA enabled, um, conveying the responsibilities from a place of knowledge and confidence that you trust them to do the right thing rather in, in empowering them rather than being fearful of them. So these findings can really help us and we can leverage these stories and better understand what is going on around us and how to implement real solutions that directly inject into this interplay in the square of crime framework. And lastly, um, keep rewarding your workforce and congratulating employees for findings, especially in regards to things with security satisfaction that are very, very important. Um, yeah, and really just by having a better understanding of the logic and worldview of these individuals, we can design more effective policies for disrupting participation in these activities. Um, thank you. I will be available following the presentation for questions, and um, you can email me or uh, message me on Twitter. That was on the first slide as well, if you wish to um, ask me anything. But thank you so much.